Well, welcome to JDI, the art of chat here on the internet with very interesting and iconic Chicago people. I don't know if he's iconic, maybe he is, but he certainly is interesting, <laughs> Greg Parker. Greg is a blues musician, plus the one passion of his life is trying to create the Chicago Blues Museum here, a museum we desperately need. 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 And you've been trying to do this for a number of years. You've had it. It's in storage right now. You just got finished with a an exhibit at the Dusable Museum. Yeah, yeah. Um, Just escape from there. All right, before we get into all that enterprise, let's okay. talk about you. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Chicago, actually. I grew up in Bronzeville, or what they call in Bronzeville now, 35th okay. Street. Were you musically inclined back then? Since I was eight, yeah. Actually, we, we, before, we actually moved in the, the new Ida B. Well projects, but before that, we lived two doors down from Sam Cooke. Did so, you really? Yes, you knew we him did. then? Yeah, yeah. I, well, I didn't know him. I was a little young, but I knew his brother, L.C., but my family did. And uh, from there, they built, like, I guess the answer to the, the migration, which was the projects, which I think was a wonderful idea, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's why they tore it down. Well, what took you out of there? Uh, music. Actually, my mother um, got me into music at Lion and Healy, mm -hmm. and I would go and take guitar lessons. I was fortunate enough to have um, this guitar teacher. Was, he was a guitar player for the Fifth Dimension at the time. That was back in the 60s. And... Um, he understood that it wasn't moving fast enough for me, so he would teach me actual songs as opposed to what was in the book. I mean, I could play by ear, but I couldn't read. And um, I got a scholarship from there and went to the Goodman Theater. And I was just always into the arts. What and did you do with the Goodman? I acted. It was brief. It wasn't. I thought it was it had something to do with music. Mm -hmm. You know, it was more acting. And um, what did you just, do on the stage? What plays? Um, there was uh, an August Wilson play, Two Trains Running. Mm -hmm. And that was, it was real brief. And some other, you know, little kitty stuff in the beginning, you know, just... Um, you knew Lawrence Fishburne, right? Yep, met him. He was actually... In the play with you? Yeah, he did. He, he had just finished. He was, he was actually doing a movie then called Cornbread Early Me or something like that. Mm -hmm. I can remember. Then I ran into him in London, though. You know, at one point, they wanted him to play Jimi Hendrix after he did that Ike and Tina Turner. Oh. And I was the understudy for that. Really? Well, I did I was going to do all the playing. Greg Parker? Yeah, yeah. Now, what led you into going now from theater to music? Uh, girls. <laughs> <laughs> You'd get more girls with rock yeah, and roll and blues? Yeah, you know. I already had the acting thing down. You know, that was already fun. No, um, just, I think, you know, when I, just the music, just, you know, the way it makes you feel. You know, it was, I was always interested in music. And I was, I was exposed to a lot of things because I used to have a little, when I was a kid, I used to have a little shoeshine box. And I would go down and have my little shoeshine box in front of the Playboy Club and, you know, back in Chicago, you could sell these, they used to sell jet magazines on the L trains. And that's what I did. And I had that job. I, I never took them the money back. I don't just show up and get new <laughs> magazines and just sell it and keep the money. And, uh, but you get exposed to things, you know, so I was always on the north side a lot. So, and then they had like the rush up in the store and mothers and clubs like that. So it just seemed more exciting. But, so it was rock first, not was blues. Rock. Yeah. Back when I was playing, there was a, it was a group called the Pez Band and Cracker and that, uh, oh. yeah, Sticks were called TW4 yeah. at the time, the group Sticks. Yeah. So I was playing like Mothers in the store, all of these suburban sort of like clubs where a brother needed 40 IDs to get in. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now you played with some very famous people. Let's brag on that. Okay, all right. All right, let's, let's do the list. Uh, Rolling Stones? Still owe me money. No, yeah, no. <laughs> Mick, yeah, yeah. Um, with Mick. His first solo album. Mm -hmm. And it was Jeff Beck and Omar Akeem on drums and Greg Filling Ains and Who else? Isaac Hayes, uh, Edwin Starr. I went over to England with Edwin Starr and Marvin Gaye. That's how I ended up living there. Everybody in the band carried a guitar. It looked like a guitar band because I knew I was going to live there. I was through with L.A. But before that, I used to um, do movie soundtracks. When you I did? first got out to California, I did um, Hail Up in Harlem. Uh, soundtrack with Edwin Starr or Fred Williams, did Friday Foster, Foxy Brown, Ideos Amigo, one of Richard Pryor's first films. In fact, I've seen that album on the internet. It's selling for like three, four hundred dollars, just that album. I haven't seen the royalty. But so I was out there working with Mickey Stevenson. He was the uh, vice president of Motown, and he just left Motown. And I worked as a pretty much a gopher for him for about a year and a half doing that. And it was an interesting experience. Some oh. stuff I can tell you about, some I can't. Uh, well, you can talk but, off camera yeah. about the other stuff. Okay. But, um, but so rock was it for a while? I and was then still playing rock. I, you know, but I, what burned you out? Nothing. Nothing? nothing Why did you switch now? 
got into blues and then well, got down you know, back after, to Chicago. After I played with Mick and everybody, I, 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 you know, I did all right from a poor boy from Chicago. And I, I lived in Europe almost 20 years. You know, I was in L.A. for 20 years. Uh, was on Casablanca with Buddy, Buddy Miles. So we toured with the Mothership Connection tour. So it wasn't a burnout. I just realized that the, the um, mortality rate wasn't big <laughs> for, <laughs> you know, for rock musicians, especially black rock musicians, you know. It was either being a drug addict or just dying, period, you know. Well, like, because, you know, the, the, the white rock musicians, they had, their managers took care of them a lot better, you know, because I was with, when I went out to California, I went out there with a guy named Cash McCall who had a group called the Rotary Connection with Minnie Ripperton, and they had the same management company as the Eagles and things. So, you know, you, you sort of, like, live the dream, and then you realize it's a business. So it wasn't, it wasn't much of a burnout. I just wanted to elevate what I was doing. I just wanted to have a little bit more longevity about what I'm doing. You start realizing that, you know, to be out there, like mm -hmm. Elvis in them last days, trying to squeeze into them leather pants. And then I had a daughter. You know, I had a family. You know, you have to have some normality about yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise you just end up like Boy George running around at 60 years old in a dress looking like somebody's <laughs> mother, <laughs> you know. Well, let's talk about what precipitated the Blues Museum idea. Um, I got interested in Willie Dixon. Uh, Cash McCall was playing with Willie Dixon, him and Louis Satisfield, one of the founding members of Earth, Wind, and Fire. And um, they were telling me what the Blues was having a hard time, you know. A lot of these guys that were famous, they really weren't making any money. I mean, for... And I found out also living in Europe, I was living off their legacy. You know, everybody thought I was a blues musician there, you know, which I was. I guess I didn't know. I mean, that's where rock music comes from. Mm -hmm. So once I got educated about that, and uh, when I got back here to visit, I spoke to a few of my friends, and I said, well, what's happening in Chicago? And everybody that really could play really good jazz music, they were all playing blues. You know, they were playing in these little clubs, but they were playing blues. So I kind of went like, well, that's where the money's at. And uh, so I said, okay, I'm the president. I just put the EDI <laughs> men on him. I'm like, okay, well, you know. And then I realized that it, it could really be something, that I was a bit puzzled that they didn't have a blues museum. So what was the first uh, collection part of this that you actually uh, had? I end up with about 350,000 negatives from the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper, which is one of the first black newspapers. And I did a few interviews in newspapers. And this guy read about me, and he says, I've got some pictures you might be interested in for your museum. And I got there, and it was Muhammad Ali and the Negro League and pictures of Lena Horn at 17, a lot of things that we've used on the show. And that was the first thing I had. I've got Muddy Waters guitars. I've got Holland Wolf's guitars. I've got Lil Walter's mics. I've got most of the personal family pictures from all of the known blues artists in Chicago, like Jimmy Reed and Muddy Waters and Jimmy Rogers and um, on a lot of things on WVON and all of the famous blues clubs on the checkerboard stuff. We own some uh, sepia magazine archive uh, amsterdam news defender newspaper uh, pittsburgh courier we own something like six thousand jet and ebony magazines because nowadays things are on microfilm mm -hmm. so a lot of times when we do a lot of movie projects like we did uh, Cadillac Records, we did the Ray Child stuff with Taylor Hackford. They want to research and they need tangible things. It's a lot easier to look at a magazine than it is to sit down and look, you know, at some that. You have a lot of vinyl, too. We got don't. tons of vinyl. I've got, well, you know what happened? My uncle was the house band at VJ Records. His name was Guitar Lefty Bates. And he played on everything that just about came out of chess and VJ from the 30s to the 70s, almost to the 70s. He co wrote at last. Get the royalty did checks he? for that. Yeah. Ooh. Fancy free Hoover Cat Food commercial. He did Your Precious Love. Um, all, of, all of the early John Lee Hooker stuff that's him recording, B.B. King, um, all the Jimmy Reed stuff, Jimmy Reed at Carnegie Hall. And when, so when he passed away, I took over his estate. And in his house, uh, he had all of these records. I think it was like 600 records that he collected that he played on. That's how he kept track of his royalties. But within that record collection, uh, the Beatles signed a first record deal with mm -hmm. VJ Records, and I've got two Beatle albums signed by the manager and all the Beatles on VJ. Still shrink wrapped. Oh my! God. You've also got some great television archival stuff, stuff films. Yeah, right? we've got Cab Calloway. We've got film on Miles Davis from 1958, 57. Uh, we've got some BB King. I got, I got Michael Jackson's audition tape. You know, nobody was interested in that two or three years ago.